Today, as part of the Decade of Commemorations program here in the Ghana District Council, uh, and part of the Peace Through Funded project, we're holding the Memorabilia Roadshow. So we have three key historians, Dr. Amy Phoenix, Dr. Johnson McMasters, and Dr. Gavin Hughes, who are going to talk about various aspects of the decade, but it also provides local people with the opportunity to take along their memorabilia and tell their little personal story related to events of the decade. There's no better place to understand the history of Ulster and later Northern Ireland than here at Castle Hill, Dungannon. From the Middle Ages here, the O'Neills had a fortress on Castle Hill. By the late 1500s, Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone, built a castle here to wage war against the forces of Queen Elizabeth I. And this was at the centre of the Nine Years' War, the defeat of the O'Neills by Chichester, and eventually, of course, the plantation of the early 1600s. In 1692, the site here at Castle Hill, the site of the old O'Neill fortress, was sold to Thomas Knox. And of course, the Knoxes became the Earls of Ranfurly, and indeed, a member of that family was Lord Northland. The decade began in 1912, and it began with the signing of the Ulster Covenant. The covenant which was an act of resistance to the possibility of home rule for Ireland. There had been two other attempts to give Ireland home rule. 1886 was the first time that was attempted, and then again in 1893, both failed. Uh, something given free with a newspaper, the Weekly Freeman. The Home Rule Act was going through the House of Commons and was about to crash and burn. And it showed you two politicians wearing orange sashes. And there was a kind of a, a, a nass between them with its mouth wide open and it said the orange nay, which seemed to be an early Ulster says no. And uh, basically, the two politicians I identified, and I think I'm right, one of them was Lord Salisbury, the leader of the, Conser of the, the Conservative Party, who had pinned his party's colour uh, to colours to the Unionist mass. And the other was Colonel Edward Saunderson, a County Cavan landlord, who had been a Liberal MP, but became a Unionist MP for North Armagh and Grand Master of the Orange Order. The high point and psychological moment in the Ulster crisis of 1912-14 was the signing of the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant by almost half a million Ulster Protestant men and women on the 28th of September 1912. And in Dungannon, that covenant was signed in places like this, the local Orange Hall, the Church of Ireland Parish Hall. It is a very important document in that, first of all, it invokes the deity. And secondly, it invokes the use of force to use all means necessary to defeat the present conspiracy to set up a Home Rule Parliament in Ireland. In 1913, Lord Northland, as the leading landowner in this area, sought to enlist Protestant men over the age of 14 into the new Ulster Volunteer Force, who were drilling on the streets of this town and surrounding areas. Within a few months, there were 850 UVF in Dungannon alone, and something like 7,000 in the whole county, according to RIC reports for 1913. And of course, this was the rise of Carson's army. Soon they were drilling and marching in the estates of friendly landowners, in Orange Halls, in Dungannon, Cookstown, and throughout County Tyrone. By 1914, surprise mobilizations were the order of the day. And indeed, on the 29th of January 1914, the RIC reported a mobilisation of this kind at Killymoon Castle at Cookstown, County Tyrone. 850 UVF men drilled and carried out, we are told, a sham fight using carbines and shotguns. This was the beginning, really, of the use of rail guns rather than dummy rifles in the kind of mimic warfare which preceded the long gun running of April 1914 a gun-running episode which would give military supremacy to the Ulster Volunteer Force. There's a document in existence which records the very precise instructions given to the UVF on that night as they brought these guns from Lard. The police record that by that March of 1914, the Nationalists became disquieted by the rise of the UVF, by the current mutiny when the British Army in Ireland had refused to march on Ulster and by the long gun running of the following month. And they decided that a nationalist volunteer force should be formed. Of course, 
Owen MacNeill had already launched the Irish Volunteers in Dublin and by March they were spreading through this county, Dungannon, uh, Oma, Cookstown, uh, Newton Stewart. Irish Volunteers were being formed. By the end of the year, the Irish Volunteers numbered 5,500 in County Tyrone. And there was a real danger of a collision between these two private armies, Carson's army and Redmond's army, as the Home Rule Act. Uh, began to make its way towards the statute book in the autumn of 1914. We're standing here at Castle Caulfield, one of the earliest plantation castles in East Tyrone, going back to the establishment of the Caulfield family in this area in the 17th century. It was in the village of Castle Caulfield nearby that Joseph Johnston was born in 1890. Johnston was the son of a local Protestant schoolmaster and he would become an economist, a fellow of Trinity College Dublin and the author of a famous book in 1913 called Civil War in Ulster, Its Objects and Probable Results, published in 1913. It's an attack on Sir Edward Carson and the Ulster Volunteer Force just a few months before the long gun running of 1914, which would transform the situation and bring Ireland much closer to civil war. It outlines the possible bloodbath if a conflict uh, occurred between the Ulster Volunteers on the one hand and the rising Irish Volunteers on the other. It was probably inspired by an incident right here in Castle Caulfield on the 12th of July, 1913 when a nationalist journalist was set upon at the reporter's table at the annual 12th celebrations. He was beaten up, there was a court case afterwards. He was one of that minority of Protestant home rulers who looked forward to the establishment of an Irish parliament in Dublin by 1914. And therefore, he stood against the tide and later became a senator of the Irish Republic. We now have two armies which are armed, and you don't arm armies uh, to sit and drink tea. You arm armies uh, to be engaged. And it is very probable that Ireland would have found itself engulfed in a fairly bloody civil war in 1914 had not the World War I, or the Great War, as it's sometimes described, broken out in that same year. That got everybody off the hook and it also diverted the attention away from the Irish problem, at least in part. Dungannon War Memorial commemorating the dead of two world wars. In this town, of course, in the rush to the colours in 1914, came men of both traditions, from the Ulster Volunteer Force, Carson's Army, and from the Irish National Volunteers, following John Redmond's injunction to go wherever the firing line extended. They wore the same uniform, they fought under the same flags, but these men had different aspirations for home rule, against home rule, for Ulster and the Empire, for Ireland and the freedom of small nations. And yet they are all commemorated, those 400 or so dead, on this war memorial plaque in the heart of Dungannon. On this plaque are commemorated the Cumberland brothers, James and John, two young men in their early 20s from Kilnacart, just outside Dungannon. They had been members of Derry Gort Reavy UVF, they joined the Ulster Division with so many others from the hills and townlands of Ulster in 1914 and they would take part in the Battle of the Somme. They were among the 5,500 casualties on that first day of the battle in France on the 1st of July 1914. There's the unveiling of the war rail in Dungannon on the 11th of November 1922. Started research about 95 and uh, just come across photographs. Had, uh, I belong to the Royal British Legion and uh, there's a, certain, a number of people there had passed away and they'd give me a box of stuff and hope them and find photographs and different all bits and pieces here. And we had a marvellous photograph from the 2nd Royal Irish Fusiliers at Quetta um, from, from uh, Heather. And in the photograph that we had, that was a snapshot of regular soldiers in 1914 in India 
before they ended up going onto the uh, the Western Front and then ending up actually in Palestine in in 1918. Yeah. Do you know what? This is fantastic because you basically it looks like you've got. It looks like yeah. Pretty much, it couldn't be the whole battalion, but it looks like. Oh, it. And there's even a dog here. The regimental mascot. Yeah. In fact, there looks like there's a, either a bugler or a drummer boy in there as well. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. You can just see behind the, behind the oh, dog. Yes, yeah, do you? yes. We're standing in New Mills, County Tyrone, at the memorial to Private Robert Morrow, one of the first Irish VCs of the Great War. Born in a farmstead nearby, Robert is described as a quiet, undemonstrative boy, and he comes across in the only photograph we have of him in military uniform as a fine-featured, serious young man. But he was to show great daring and courage during the Battle of Messines in Belgium uh, in 1915. At 5 p.m. on the 12th of April, 1915, the Royal Irish Fusiliers' trenches were pounded by heavy German artillery fire, churning the trench into a terrible debris of men and earth. Many men were killed outright, others buried alive. But Robert Morrow, under heavy shell fire, rescued several comrades from a frontline trench. He was recommended for the Victoria Cross, but was sadly killed just two weeks later before his VC had been made public. His medal was handed to his widowed mother uh, in 1916 at Buckingham Palace by King George V. On the 15th of October 1915, King George V wrote to Mrs. Morrow in New Mills, it is a matter of sincere regret to me that the death of Private Robert Morrow deprived me of the pride of personally conferring upon him the VC, the greatest of all distinctions. And today, Private Morrow was remembered here in New Mills in this fine memorial in the centre of the village. The, the standard medals from the First World War are obviously these three here, which all soldiers served the First World War received. Authorised in 1918, the 1914-15 star was awarded to personnel who saw service in France and Flanders from the 23rd of November 1914 to the 31st of November 1915. The British War Medal, 1914 to 1920, was authorised in 1919 and was awarded to eligible service personnel and civilians. The Victory Medal, 1914 to 1919, was also authorised in 1919 and was awarded to all eligible personnel who served on the establishment of a unit in an operational theatre. Fairly, this the scroll that accompanied the medals, the campaign medals that were sent to Private Joseph Henry's parents. Uh, he was originally from Dungana. And indeed, um, Pamela's little uh, morning brooch from the Royal Irish Rifles, which we think might be something to do with a, an officer in the Great War, perhaps, maybe. These were given to me um, about 20 years ago by a First World War veteran. Mm -hmm. And you see the regiments on it. Um, a lot of these regiments no longer exist. But obviously, you've got things like the cyclist corps and so on mm -hmm. here. German pickle hobs from the First World War. Uh, these are officers, uh, dress helmets. Uh, but once you got into the battle itself, you're talking about these uh, cold scuttle helmets. Um, this is the one that gave the, the Germans a very bad reputation the First World War, the, the German butcher bayonet with the serrated back edge. But in actual fact, while well, these were banned at the Geneva Convention in the Second World War, the um, they were actually used mainly as pioneer weapons for cutting wood, so there's, the, you know, as I say, they just got a bad reputation in the First World War. God bless you, little shiny one, and speed you on your way, and may each blessed one of you into a German stay. These were done by soldiers who were recuperating in a, a London hospital in the, after the First World War, 1914 to 16. Just a piece of information or a badge or a drawing. Now, a lot of these soldiers never made it out of the hospital. Brendan and Kevin Rafferty had brought a couple of interesting things. One was a letter, actually, from um, Una O'Connor, 
who appears to have a Tyrone name, Agnes McGlade, and was writing to one or two different people in Dungannon in the early years, it seemed to be, of the First World War. There was a postcard sent from Rouen in France, which was undated, signed Una. She was a well-known Irish actress in the Abbey and then in America. It's very clear from the letter, in a beautiful sort of flowing hand, that Una O'Connor was in France to provide concerts for wounded soldiers. She talks about meeting two Irish men, one from Cavan, one from Oma, and she's going to see one who has lost both feet uh, in the near future. And then she says at the end, almost sorrowfully, that she can't hear any guns. She's too far away from the the front line uh, in Rouen. You may be interested in this. It's very heavy. It's a statue of Venus, and it was sculpted by my grandfather, who was involved in the 1916, not the Rising, but the Battle of Jutland. And he made two of these. The reason why they're so heavy is because this is part of a German U-boat. I look at this and I'm proud of, of my grandfather's creativity and what he was capable of doing. I mean, that's quite a piece of work on a lathe, no doubt. But I also have to ask myself, how many lives does this represent? When we look at this decade from 1912 to 1922, 1914-1918, I think, is the event that frames the whole lot. That is the big event. We're standing here at Northland Row in Dungannon, the family home of Thomas J. Clark, one of the key architects of the Easter Rising of 1916. Tom Clark wasn't actually born here. He was born in the Isle of Wight, the son of an Irish Protestant father and an Irish Catholic mother. And they settled in this home just opposite St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. Thomas Clark went to the local school and by the age of 21 had become an assistant teacher there. In 1878, he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the Fenian movement thrown up in the years after the Great Famine. There was an arms incident with the Royal Irish Constabulary, and in 1880, Clark was forced to flee Dungannon on a ship for the United States. He was back in Britain in 1883, involved in a Fenian bombing campaign for which he was sentenced to penal servitude for life. He spent the next 15 years in British prisons, amnestied finally in 1898, returning to the United States. And then in 1907, he settled in Dublin with his Irish-born wife, the famous Kathleen Clark. In those years, Clark and others built up the Irish Republican Brotherhood as an underground conspiracy. In 1915, he was a member of that military council which began to plan a rising using the newly formed Irish volunteers. He was in the GPO at headquarters on the 24th of April 1916 and following the surrender of the insurgents, he was court-martialed and executed on the 3rd of May. This is St. Patrick's Hall in Colan, the Victorian building where the Irish volunteers arrived on Holy Saturday 1916 as part of the manoeuvres preliminary to the 1916 Rising. Dennis McCullough, the leader of the Irish volunteers in Belfast, had orders from Dublin to lead his men, 132 of them, to County Tyrone, to rendezvous with the Tyrone Irish Volunteers under Dr. Patrick McCartan. Connolly had given orders to McCullough that there must be no shot fired in Ulster. The Northern Volunteers should march from Tyrone across the Iron, across the Shannon, and link up with Liam Meadows rising in the west of Ireland in Galway. But of course, confusion and chaos reigned. Owen McNeill had cancelled, contramanded the order for a general insurrection. And so Pierce and Connolly and their colleagues fell back on the Dublin plan, a limited rising. And so over that weekend, as confusion reigned, McCullough met Dr. Patrick McCartan, the leading IRB man in County Tyrone, and it was decided not to take part in the rising. In the end, McCullough led his men by train back to Belfast. And that was the only action during 1916 in Ulster. And it happened right here, in this hall, in Coal Island. 
We're standing here in Dungannon Main Square, the scene of many political meetings and parades over the last century. In March 1918, this was the scene of a major election meeting under the auspices of the Sinn Féin party, rising from the ashes of the Easter Rising. But here in Ulster, and particularly in East Tyrone, opinion remained very much focused on the old Home Rule Party. The candidate in this area was Sean Milroy for Sinn Féin, who was opposed by Thomas Harbison for the Old Irish Nationalist Party. In the square that day were Eamon de Valera, president of Sinn Féin, and the rebel Countess, Countess Markovic, a heroine of the 1916 Rising. She had been sentenced to death in 1916, commuted, and then finally released a year later. She's standing on a platform here, uh, at that fair day of 1918 and she was being heckled by a hostile nationalist crowd linked to the ancient order of Hibernians. As reported in an eyewitness account at the time, Countess Markovich, harried by stones, turned to the crowd and said, I care as little for your stones as I did for the bullets of Easter week. In the resulting count, the Nationalist Party was successful, defeating Sinn Féin by, by 600 votes. Standing here on Castle Hill, Dungannon, we can see the whole panorama of the Ulster countryside. Tyrone, Fermanagh, in the distance the Sleeve Bay Mountains leading into County Monaghan. This was the disputed area in that period 1912 to 1923. Winston Churchill talked about the, the dreary steeples after the First World War when he said, great empires had been overthrown, the whole map of Europe had been changed, but as the deluge subsides and the waters fall, we see again the dreary steeples steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone. The integrity of their quarrel was one of the few institutions that remained unaltered in the cataclysm which had swept the world. But here's a decade that is a decade of enormous change in Ireland, all parts of Ireland, but a decade also of huge violence in Ireland, and a decade that has left a lot of issues a decade that shaped, as we said at the beginning, shaped Ireland for the rest of the 20th century and is still casting shadows over our lives together on this island. So this is not just a matter of looking back. This is a matter of looking back to try and understand the past, the dynamics of which are still swirling around. But when we look back, we also look back, and we only, I think, ought to look back if we are prepared at the same time to put on the table somehow our vision of the future and if the future can be different and if the future can be better and if the future can be shared. <laughs> 